Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to this last lecture on the course on introduction to cognitive psychology. Now over the past 12 weeks, we have been dealing with uh, several areas of cognitive psychology uh, starting with introduction to cognitive psychology, the chapters on perception, attention, uh, then uh, the chapter on memory, various forms of memory, then into language and uh, thought thinking process, problem solving, reasoning and decision make and ending finally with decision making. So, this last lecture I have dedicated to basically summing up what we did in this 12 weeks. So, what I will do in this particular lecture is briefly get back to each section that we did along this 12 weeks and review what we did in all of these lectures and uh, basically also sort of refresh you into what each topic that we wanted to do or that covered. So, basically it is a review kind of a lecture and it will be very very brief. So, I will be briefly touching into uh, topics that were content of each lecture for each week. So, the lecture was designed uh, in, in basically four modules. The uh, total course of cognitive psychology comprised of four modules and within these modules we had different different lectures. Each module had two to three subtopics and they had their individual lectures and all of them comprises to a bucket of 30 lectures which then was divided into a 12 week period. Referring back to what is cognition. So, what is cognition? Basically, cognition is a, a mental activity and so, cognitive psychology with it studies how these mental events or mental representations which are basically the representation of any event or any uh, object in the external world, how they are manipulated and studied. And so, in this course on cognitive psychology, what we tend to do is study how this manipulations of mental event is done by the mind or the brain. And so, that is what we will do in this whole lecture that is an outway or uh, an outline of this particular review lecture. So, basically this course on cognitive psychology comprises as I said of four modules. The first module that we did had two lectures onto it and the module was called introduction to the study of cognitive psychology and it had lectures on the history of the cognitive psychology and also on the methodology with it. In module 2, we covered some of the basic cognitive processes which are applied onto mental events, onto mental representations and the cognitive processes that we studied in our in this particular course was basically perception and attention. So, we will uh, be then evaluating these two or studying or reviewing these two cognitive processes and also I think we, we did memory onto it. The third module was basically organization of knowledge. So, the first two modules basically uh, tell you uh, the first module basically focuses on what is cognition and what is cognitive knowledge and what is the background of cognitive psychology, the history of cognitive psychology and how does it develop, what are the research methodologies in it and that kind of a thing. The second module covered on to basic cognitive processes, how an input is taken and this input which is taken from the various senses, sense organs, how they are converted into meaningful organizations or into knowledge or mental representations. So, basically it is the pre-processing, it is those uh, processes, those cognitive processes or those cognitive work benches where raw information which is captured through our uh, primary senses, they are pre-processed before meaning is generated out of it. In module 3, we looked at organization of knowledge. So, given the fact that the basic cognitive processes are able 
to extract information from the raw input that is given up by the senses this input has to be safe somewhere or it has to be kept somewhere in, in a particular format which is called mental representation. And so, this third module were basically focused on to how this mental representation uh, is stored and where it is stored and the, what is the format and how it is accessed, what are the limits of it and so on and so forth. So, it is basically the organization of knowledge into the human brain. And the fourth module was once the knowledge is stored, once the knowledge has been attained by the basic cognitive processes and they have been stored uh, or organized into the memory, how are they accessed and what how are meaning generated out of it or how is this knowledge successfully used is what the fourth module looked into. And so, what we will do from now on from the next slide onwards, we will take up each of these module one by one and then explain to you what we covered there and how it relates to the next module or the next chapter. So, under module 1 in, in the week 1 what we did was we looked at the history and the study of human cognition. So, the first week which uh, first and second week which are part of the <coughs> first module there we looked at uh, briefly at the history of cognitive psychology, how does cognitive psychology come into being, what does it study, what are its proponents, what are the basic principles governing cognitive psychology and after that we also looked at the various research methodologies which are available for doing cognitive psychology. For someone who is interested in cognitive psychology, what are the research methodologies that you are going to do. So, we started our journey in the section of history and study of human cognition by studying or by basically reading about the basic debates in philosophy. For example, the debate about nativism and empiricism or the debate about mind and body problem. Now, these debates about empiricism and nativism or mind body problem or nature nurture issue, they describe or they form the basic core of where cognitive psychology comes in. Because it was the philosophers before the coming of the science of psychology that they wanted to study what is the difference between the mind and the soul and they wanted to study what is the mind. And they were interested, these philosophers were the ones who were interested of, on how human beings do things that they do. So, they had no idea what the mind is or the brain composed of and at that point of time they wanted to study why individuals, why humans are different and so they proposed these theories. Now, for example, the empiricism and nativism theory, they emphasizes one of it emphasizes the role of heredity in producing knowledge or in gaining knowledge and the other emphasizes the fact that human beings are born with a blank state of mind, but later in life through experience they develop knowledge. So, knowledge is not something which is passed on from heredity, it comes on through the interaction with people, interaction with the environment. So, these debates basically move forward the idea of what is the basis of cognitive psychology. Further on we went ahead and studied the basic schools of psychology. We looked at the basic schools of psychology, schools like structuralism, functionalism, gestalt school, the school of behaviorism and the cognitive school. And all these schools what they did was they provided us the basis or the reason how cognitive psychology developed as a field. So, these schools, the study of these schools gave us an idea of what is cognitive psychology, what is the content of cognitive psychology and how these schools mattered in the coming up with the field of cognitive psychology. Especially the cognitive revolution, the idea of cognitive regulation or the cognitive school, they for the first time introduced the fact that behaviorism believed that stimulus response is how a particular behavior is related to uh, a particular kind of a stimulus. And so, behaviorism believed that there is nothing called the mind, there is nothing called the brain, there is nothing called mental activities or mental events. And so, each response that a person does, each behavior that a person does is directly related to the upcoming stimulus or to any external or internal stimuluses. And so, for the first time when the cognitive revolution comes in, people started focusing on the O in SR. And so, the O was introduced which basically meant that stimuluses do not directly respond to, directly give, give response or directly produce behavior, but rather there was an organism or there was a human mind which controlled responses. So, stimulus responses were not kind of a mechanistic rule, but an organism or a human mind controlled the response. And this is for the first time the cognitive revolution produced the idea or the cognitive school of thought produce the idea that the human mind is responsible for producing all kind of inputs. 
Further on, we looked at the definition of what mental events are, we looked at what are mental representations. For example, what mental representations are, mental representations are basically representations or these are encodings of any event or any person, place or thing into the human mind. So, anything that happens in the external environment has to be stayed in the brain uh, in a particular format, in the mind in a particular format and that are what mental representations are. And so, these representations are have a format and a particular kind of a encoding. So, the format describes what the mental representation in which way it is encoded and the content of mental representation describe what it wants to say and we explained it in that chapter in terms of both the special as well as the pictorial definitions or the spatial and the um, uh, propositional kind of representations of how particular uh, information can be represented in the human brain. So, that is what we did in this section. Further than that, we also looked at several other schools of thought or several other paradigms which went ahead and described how cognitive psychology progressed. For example, we looked at the evolutionary school, we looked at the connectivist school, the information processing paradigm and so on and so forth. In addition to that, we also looked at why study the brain if you want to study cognitive psychology and the reasoning that was provided there was because study of the brain for studying cognitive psychology provide us not only identifiability effects, but also it gives us the adequacy effect. It basically means that studying the brain will tell us what functions are responsible for or what kind of mental activities are responsible related to what kind of brain uh, activations and that way a relation a correlation can be matched up. In the second week, we went ahead and studied theories and researches in human cognition. In this particular lecture, we looked at the various research methodologies that has been used for creating or studying cognition. And the three primary research methodologies that we studied was the, st the methodology of behavioral approach, the correlational approach, the casual approach and the modeling approach. Now, in the behavioral approach, we primarily use three different type of measurements. The first measurement being the measurement of accuracy, the second measurement being the measurement of reaction time, the third measurement being the measurement of judgment and these three measurement or these three criteria can be used to, uh, to measure or to design experiments in cognitive psychology. Beside the behavioral methodology for studying cognitive psychology, there is also something called the correlational method of studying cognitive psychology or cognitive phenomena or mental events and this correlational method uses the input from uh, devices like uh, such as the electroencephalographs or the mental uh, the MEG the magnetoencephalographs. Now, the mental uh, the magnetoencephalograph or the electroencephalographs they provide us brief uh, idea about what happens at the brain when a particular mental event is being processed or a particular mental event is being taken care of. In addition to the EEG and the MEG, uh, there are devices which are called the positive emotion tomography, the MRIs and fMRIs all of which provides us what happens or tells us what happens at the brain when a certain mental activity is happening and so they gave us kind of a correlational structure. So, if some change in a mental event happens, correlational change or a, a simultaneous change also happens in the brain and these equipments provide us the idea of what happens into the brain when a particular uh, cognitive activity happens. Beside that, I explained to you the causal network where we looked at three methodologies, the methodology of using neurophysiological studies in which patients were studied for finding out what are the reasons for or how is brain related to the particular cognitive activity. We also looked at an equipment called the TMS which can specifically inhabit certain areas of the brain and study how a particular area is related to a particular mental activity and a third way of using uh, drugs or certain kind of inhibitors, neurotransmitter inhibitors for studying or inhibiting certain kind of brain region and studying the function of that brain region. In addition to that, the last uh, method that we used in this particular section was the method of uh, modeling in which what we studied is there are different computer models can be generated and these models are two in nature, the box model and uh, the neural network model and both of these models can be used to uh, basically represent the men mental activity of how a mental activity gets processed or how a mental event gets processed. So, this is what we did in the first two week and this is what we studied in the first two chapters. In week 3, we looked at 
object perception and recognition. And so, in this particular section in object perception and uh, recognition what we looked on to or what we studied was we looked at both the classical and the gestalt approach to perception. Now, in the classical approach it was said that there is something called distal and proximal stimulus and that is how a perception really happens. So, basically the idea of this chapter was to study how perceptions are developed or how uh, information which is passed on from the sensation that is taken into the brain and that is coded into the brain through the process which is called perception. And so, two theories were studied the classical theory said that uh, whenever something and we basically studied the visual perception we specifically studied the visual perception although at a later point we also describe a little bit of auditory perception, but we focused ourselves into visual perception because that is the easiest sense to study. It. And so, in terms of visual perception we studied the classical theory which says that there is something called a proximal stimulus and there is something called a distal stimulus and these two stimuluses interact together to form images onto the retina which are further carried on to the specialized object recognition area of the brain in the occipital lobe and from there meaning is generated. We also looked at certain theories of object perception for example, the bottom up and the top down theories. Now, within the bottom up theories we looked at something called the template matching theory, we also looked at something called the feature analysis theory and the prototype matching theory. The difference being that in template matching theory uh, it proposes that there are a huge number of templates in the brain and that helps someone in recognizing a particular object in, in the external field of vision. Whereas, the feature analysis theory goes ahead and says that object recognition is not based on these kind of human templates the reason being that so many templates cannot be stored in the brain. So, it is instead of the number of templates stored in the brain it is the pattern it is the feature of particular object which is of use for doing object recognition. Whereas, the prototype theory says that neither the feature analysis theory nor, nor the template matching theory is enough because so many templates cannot be stored in the brain and neither the feature analysis theory tells us what a feature could be. So, the prototype uh, model says that human brain uh, creates a prototype and this prototype is what actually goes ahead and helps us in doing bottom up processing. So, what is bottom up processing? In bottom up processing we start with the very basic uh, knowledge we start with the very basic inputs which are coming from the visual senses and from there we try to do the object perception. In opposition to the so uh, coming from general to specific or uh, looking at a number of information uh, which is out there and combining the, all this information to understand what an object is is called bottom up process. So, it is from bottom of the pyramid going towards top of the pyramid. In opposition to the bottom up process there is a something called the top down process and in the top down process we actually studied how the experience past experiences of human beings help us in object uh, identification and within the top down process we studied something called uh, perceptual learning, uh, we studied change blindness and word superiority effect all of which displays that the human experience is enough in creating perception. And lastly in this section on perception recognition object perception recognition we study something called direct perception which is the theory which is directly opposing to the theory of classical perception and gestalt perception. So, what does the theory say? It says that human beings do not need to do anything onto the incoming stimuluses rather the incoming stimuluses has enough information the incoming light from an object in the external field has enough information when it falls into the retina and that is enough to create any kind of any perception which is needed. In the fourth week we uh, ventured on to the chapter on attention and attentional processes and cognition and so in this sec section we specifically select uh, studied selective attention although so what is attention basically attention is focusing yourself into a particular information so, focusing your senses into a particular information and we looked into the uh, selective attention. Within the selective attention we discussed several theories uh, which are of selective attention for example, one of the theory that we discussed was the filter theory, we also looked at Anna Tresman's theory of attenuation, we looked at the late selection theory, we looked at Kahneman's theory and schema theory. 
Now, all these theories differ from each other in certain ways. For example, lead selection theory says that the bottleneck that is there in terms of attention is not at the start of attentional process, but at a later part of an attentional process. Whereas, the filter theory suggests that whatever falls, whatever information falls on the perceptual system, it is filtered right there at the beginning of the attentional process. The lead selection theory says that this filtering happens at the uh, end of it. And there are several reasoning or there are several line of experimentation which has been provided for the support of these theories. Similarly, the attenuation theory says that nothing is filtered out in an attentional filter. What happens is only the volume of information which is available is toned down. Similar to that, there is Kahneman's theory which talks about alertness and certain propositional requirements uh, uh, and certain other kind of a motivational needs which all come together to decide how attention is focused on to something. And the schema theory is direct vague theory which basically goes ahead and says that whatever is not perceived is never looked on to and that is the reason why attention is an all or none kind of a phenomena. Beside that we also looked at how attention becomes on what conditions attentions become automatic and how this automaticity of attention actually helps people. Towards the end of the chapter, we discuss something called the psychological refractive period, which basically suggests or which basically is the time gap or the time required for somebody to process two incoming informations. So, if two incoming informations are given to someone who is uh, processing up already, so two incoming informations uh, occur simultaneously to a person, this person will be delayed in replying to the second information and this delay is what is called the psychological refractive period. In the fifth week, we looked at encoding and retrieving of memory traces and so in this particular week, we looked at what is human memory. So, we discussed the popular modal model of human memory which talks about sensory memory, then the short term memory and long term memory. Beside that, we also looked at different kind of sensory memories which are available. For example, the iconic memory and the echoic memory and also the haptic memory. We looked at what is STM and we looked at the various features of STM. Before that, we also discussed in detail what are the features of an icon and what are the features of an echo and how they are distinguished and we just discussed several experiments of what an echo and what an icon is of a, a sensory memory. In terms of the short term memory, we looked at what is short term memory, what is its capacity, what it can do, what it cannot do, what are the kind of forgetting that it, it, it happens from short term memory. The coding in short term memory which is basically in terms of uh, the, the semantics in acoustic coding. We also looked at how forgetting happens. We discussed two experiments on Braun and Peterson and Weig and Norman of how forgetting actually happens in short term memory. Towards the end of it, this section we looked at what something called working memory. So, working memory which is an improvement on short term memory. So, we looked into that. So, what is basically working memory? It is an improvement on short term memory. Whereas, the proposition goes that short term memory is a store which is non dynamical in nature. Working memory proposes a store which is more dynamical in nature in the sense that it has three different parts. It has something called a central executive, it has something called a phonological loop, it has something called a visual special sketch pad. And so, as against the fact the short term memory is not directly connected to long term memory, it cannot directly interact with long term memory, working memory at all points of time are connected to the long term memory to something called the episodic buffer. And I provided you reasons of why this improvement was necessary and what this improvement actually meant. So, this was the first part of the lecture. In the second part of lecture, we looked at what is long term memory. So, in the first part of the uh, lecture, we looked at what is STM, what is uh, sensory memory, the coding, the forgetting, the variables which are affecting it and so on and so forth. In the second part of this lecture on lecture 5, between lecture 5 and lecture 6, there was another uh, section on long term memory where we looked specifically on what is long term memory and how does coding uh, happen in long term memory. So, basically the coding that happens in long term memory is semantic in nature. We also looked at the uh, various forgetting theories of long term memory and some popular theories that we discussed was the decay theory, the interference theory, the poor encoding theory and so on and so forth. We also discussed what is the capacity of long term memory and so what it can store how it can store, what it can process and what it cannot. We discussed two basic types of 
recall method, two basic types of retrieval method from long term memory. So, if information is stored in long term memory, how is it pushed back or how is it retrieved back? And we discussed recall and recognition being the two method of retrieving information from long term memory. Recall being a method in which a person has to remember from his memory and write something back. In recognition, some distractors are provided with the correct answer and the person has to identify the correct answer and discriminate it from the distractor. So, these are the two methods which are there. We also looked at something called context effect and state effects in long term memory and we showed how varying the context and keeping the context uh, same while encoding in long term memory and while retrieval in long term memory the benefit of memory is seen. We also looked at the physiological state the person is or the mood the person is also helps in better remembering of long term memory or worse remembering of long term memory. We also here included the distinctions of long term memory in terms of the declarative and procedural types. So, here itself we saw how long term memory is defined into two parts the declarative and the procedural type. In the declarative type the whole memories are kept which are conscious in nature whereas, in the procedural, procedural type the implicit memories are kept and we also discussed how this declarative memory is further broken down into its semantic and episodic form and how the procedural memories are bro broken down into its classical conditioning habit and priming and several other forms of procedural memory. So, this is the, uh, what we did there. At the end of this section, we looked at reconstruction of memory or why, why memory reconstruction is there, how false memory is formed and what is called eyewitness testimony. So, basically what we understand is that memory is never true whatever we store has some form of reconstruction onto it. And so, at the end of the section we looked at the experiment by Loftus and several of the experiments for example, the DRM paradigm, the Dees Rodriga McDermott paradigm which basically shows us that the memory the information which is kept in memory is never accurate. It is never a representation of the events that has happened and it is always a reconstruction which is there and we tried to focus here or we tried to tell here I tried to evaluate and show to you that memory is never true it is all it is always a reconstruction of the the in information or the manipulation of information which was originally stored in the next section of memory in general knowledge what we did was we started the section with an uh, introduction to the distinction between the episodic and the semantic form. So, in the last chapter we saw how long term memory is broken down into its declarative and procedural format and within the procedural format we have the semantic and the episodic store. So, this section started by distinguishing between what is episodic memory and what is semantic memory and this section was particularly dedicated to semantic memory. So, semantic memory is that memory which holds in knowledge information worldly fact and things like that a daily routine events all those information are stored into something called the semantic store or semantic a part of the long term memory. Whereas, in the episodic form or in the episodic part of the long term memory, we have events life events which are stored and there are several different types of episodic memory which are there and so or associated memories for example, there is something called the autobiographical memory, there is something called the flashbulb memory and we discussed that at the end of the last section. In this particular section, we looked at memory for general knowledge which is semantic memory. So, we looked at what is semantic memory and what are the different models of semantic memory. The particular models that we discussed in this particular chapter was the hierarchical semantic model the, or the HSM and the HSM what we found out is that the various knowledges which are stored in semantic memory they are connected through hierarchies or they are connected by something called nodes and pointers. And so, it new information uh, has a superordinate node and superordinate node. The way information is coded is in terms of categories and concepts and so, these concepts and categories are how information is stored onto one another and uh, this uh, the hierarchical semantic uh, network model basically explained how information this general information is stored as hierarchies within the semantic memory. Beside the hierarchical semantic model, we also looked at something called the feature comparison model which was an improvement on the hierarchical semantic model and said that since the there was some problem the criticism with the hierarchical semantic model in terms of verification of sentences verification of information uh, which is present in hierarchical semantic model. The feature analysis model says that information is not stored in terms of hierarchies rather it is stored in terms of feature analysis. So, based on the core features and based on the characteristic defining and the characteristic features information is actually stored into these hierarchical networks or information is stored into the semantic memory. 
We also looked at something called the spreading activation model which says that whenever one concept or whenever one particular information bit is excited this information this excitation or this kind of a retrieval is spread on to concepts which are related to each other and how multiple concepts which are somehow related to each other are activated when particular node is activated. So, how does the spreading happens or how does energy spread from one node to the other node. So, these are some of the models that we studied into and beside that we also stu studied the ACT model the Anderson's ACT model which talks about three different kind of memory system the working memory system, the procedural memory and the declarative memory and th what this model said is declarative memory is entirely different from procedural memory in the sense that in procedural memory we have some kind of propositional thoughts and propositional structures whereas in the declarative memory the common form of memory is looked into and the working memory was a connection between these declarative procedural type of memory. So, this was an end to this section on memory of general information. In the next section was based on defining what are concepts and categories and so what why we wanted to study concepts and categories is because in the earlier section on semantic memory we saw that the node consists of concepts and categories. So, what are concept? Concepts are basically representations of worldly knowledge. So, uh, how, however something is represented what is the way in which a uh, particular information is represented to the human brain or human mind is what concepts are and categories are similar concepts or things which have similarities together how they are clubbed together is what is called categories. So, we looked at how categories and concepts are formed we also looked at the various nature or various models of concept for example, we looked at the classical view which says that how the way in which concepts are formed or how we categorize things together is in terms of the fact that the more closely two things appear together identical they are clubbed together. In opposition to this the prototype view concept and categorization suppose the, uh, suggests that there is an abstraction which is made out of it because it, it might happen that two things may not be similar, but they are clubbed together. For example, a bird which does not has feather will, will be more of a bird than any other kind of an animal. And so, this kind of violations led to the proposition or the prototype model which says that people make abstractions people when they look into a certain kind of a concept or certain kind of an object for people when forming categories they make abstractions of what the category element is. So, uh, from that prototype they actually go ahead and then include other members into that particular category. Then we came for to something called the, uh, the schemata view and exemplar view in the exemplar view what we looked at is that these prototypes that we talked about. So, basically what people do is when making categorization they look at all the elements which are present in the category and from that they, they create an abstraction they look at the commonality and based on the commonality they create an abstraction. Now, in the prototype view the idea was that this abstraction may or may not exist in real life, but the exemplar view suggests that the abstraction that we have made in the prototype view does exist in real life. So, when we think about fruits. I am thinking about a particular fruit may be an apple and so this is the exemplar view it says that when I say the category fruit the idea that fruit is something that is eat it, uh, that you eat it has seeds it has a particular taste and so on and so forth, but we also think about a particular fruit for example, an orange or an apple and so on and so forth and so this is what this particular concept of exemplar view suggests. In addition to this, this chapter also explained how concepts are really formed, what are the way in which concepts are formed and so in this we discuss successful scanning, conservative focusing and some other methods of forming a concept. Beside that we also looked at how people acquire prototypes and once they acquire prototypes how do they use to form this kind of a knowledge system that we have discussed in the semantic that is useful in forming and organizing semantic memory. In the 8th week we discussed on to something called the visual and spatial nature of memory. And so, in this we looked at what is visual memory. So, visual memory is mental imagery, it is basically similar to the fact that when I ask you to think about something by closing your eyes and when I ask you to imagine something what do you imagine. So, the same kind of thought the same kind of imagination that you do is what is called visual memory. We also looked at some mental mnemonics which are useful which are mental shortcuts or which are mental aids which help us in remembering things and some of the mnemonics that we discussed here were the method of loci, the uh, method of interactive
interacting images and the method of pegboards. Now, what this mnemonics tends to do is they tend to organize information in such a way in such a visual manner that people tend to remember them better and this remembering them better makes their memory better or makes better encoding of their memory. In addition to this, we looked at two popular theories of the visual memory of how why visual memory is better than any other kind of memory and the one method or the one theory was the dual coding hypothesis and the other theory was the relational organization hypothesis. Whereas, the dual coding hypothesis suggests that whenever something is committed to visual memory, it has two codes an auditory code and a visual code and since it has two codes, it is better remembered. The relational organization hypothesis says that it the better learning is not because of the fact that any memory which is committed to visual memory has two codes, it is because of the fact that there is a relation established between uh, the number of interacting images. And so, number of images if an image is taken and if two, two things have to be remembered, two bits of or three bits of information has to be remembered and if we make imagery of these three bits of information and make them interacting together, the interacting image is better remembered than separate images. And so, this is what the theory goes on and says. Then we looked at theories of mental rotation, which basically goes ahead and says that it is not only that we store static visual imagery, we also are able to do mental manipulations, rotations of mental images and there are several theories out there. There are several experiments to prove that people are able to mentally rotate an image, mentally rotate a particular information or mental representation. In addition to that, we looked at what is the nature of visual imagery and we discussed some of the uh, some of these nature for example, the nature of implicit encoding, perceptual equivalence, spatial equivalence and so on and so forth. And this is where we ended the section on visual and spatial memory. The next section was about studying language or understanding what language was. And in this section, we started by first identifying what is language and how it is different from communication. So, language has a particular format, it has a particular grammar, it is arbitrary in nature, it has a particular structure and then it can be used to create new sentences whereas, communication is bounded by certain limits. So, language uh, and uh, communication differs in the fact that communication is restrictive in what information it can pass. But language is not restrictive because it has several features which helps us into communicating a number of ideas across a number of people and it is the universal method of combining two people or multiple people together. We also looked at the structure of language here. Now, in the structure of language, we looked at how a language is really built. So, we looked at what is the basic level, the phonemes level, the morphemes level, the level of the a syntax, the level of uh, the semantics, the level of the pragmatics and so on and so forth. So, at the phoneme level, at the word level, uh, how information is, we looked at the phonology and phoneme level. From there, we moved to morphology where the basic speech sound are combined together to give the first words and then or the first sentences. And from there, we came up to the level of the syntax, which is how sentences are written in, in particular language. For example, we discussed the English language here. So, we looked at the grammar or the syntax. So, a sentence can be completely syntactic, but it may have no meaning. And so, generating meaning out of a sentence is what is called semantics. So, semantics is the study of meaning of a language. A language could have a perfect way or a perfect syntax, which means that it could be grammatically correct, but it could produce no meaning. And so, this production of meaning is what is called semantics. From semantics, we moved on to something called pragmatics, which is the social rule of how a language should be used. And so, this is what we did in this section. Other than that, we looked at how language comprehension happens and with language comprehension, we also looked at how text comprehension and sentence comprehension happens. Now, in language comprehension, it is believed that language unlike text is continuous in nature and so changing one phoneme can change some can change something else. So, language comprehension is basically categorical in nature in the sense that people form categories and they understand the language which has been broken. Since language is not broken down. Whereas, in text perception, what really happens is that there are something called circuits and fixations of the human eye that leads to perception of text. In terms of processing sentences, sentence perception happens in form of the gist way. So, people read a particular sentence or a particular paragraph and generate a list out of it or generate a gist out of it and gist is what is remaining with people. So, meaning is or gist is what remains and all other words and meanings are taken away from it. So, this is what the perception happens. 
Then we looked at several errors in speech production, different different kinds of errors which can be there and how they are compensating for language or the, how they uh, uh, show what languages is or capable of and what is or not capable of. In the end of it, we looked at something called story grammars, which are basically how stories are perceived. So, any story grammar uh, is basically a way in which a story is made and how it is read and how the meanings are generated. So, story grammars are basically a structure of any story and so this ended the section on human language skills. Next came the section on thinking and problem solving and so in this particular section we started by first defining what a problem is. We looked at two different kind of problems, the problems of the ill defined and well defined problem and the routine and non routine problem. So, we looked at both this kind of problems which are out there and what is the difference between that. We also looked at different kinds of problems which exist. For example, we have the analogous the arrangement problem, the divergent problem, the transformational problem, the arrangement problem and the induction problem and so on and so forth. So, we looked at different kind of problems which could be out there. We also looked at the various approaches to the solution of problem. For example, the behavioral approach where we looked at trial and error as the reason of how a problem is solved and we also looked at the gestalt approach in which it is the phase of induction and the phase of waiting which leads to the final answer. So, a stage where people just do not do anything and they wait and that leads to the I experience and that generates the solution. We also look at various variables which affect problem solving. For example, problem representations, it could be mental set, functional fixedness or stereotypes which can help in the formation of ill defined problems or how what can the errors be there in problem formation. We looked at various strategies and problem solution. For example, we looked at the algorithmic strategy, we looked at the strategy of heuristics and we looked at the means and strategies. So, there, there are different strategies how a problem can be solved and at the end of this we looked at what is creativity, what are different kinds of creativity which is out there and we looked at two dimensional view of mapping creativity. Next section that we discussed was a section on reasoning and in this section we looked at how so, the reasoning and decision making the last two sections are basically sections in which we uh, looked at the higher order cognitive processes. Up till now, up till before uh, language or till language, it was the basic cognitive process which was taking information from perception, sensation, attention, memory and they were creating raw materials. From the sections on thinking and problem solving, reasoning and decision making, interpretations are made of these mental representations and so in reasoning, we looked at what is reasoning. So, basically reasoning is an evaluation of conclusion which is given which is based on a given meaning. So, we looked at what is reasoning and how reasoning is used or how evaluations are generated. Beside that we looked at different kinds of reasoning. So, the two kinds of reasoning which are there which is called deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Within the deductive reasoning we have the syllogistic reasoning and we have the conditional reasoning. We also looked at inductive reasoning which is another form of reasoning how we come from general to specific. So, this is the kind of differences which we looked into. We also addition to that we also looked at several criticisms of these reasoning processes. In addition to that, we also looked at what is judgment, how does judgment really work and what is the meaning of judgment. So, basically judgment is reasoning or uh, the applied to a given information for generating a particular conclusion. We looked at several errors in judgment into this section. For example, some of the errors that we discussed was the error on uh, availability heuris, the available error on the representative heuristics and the anchoring and what these errors really mean is that these errors lead to faulty judgments or lead to inconclusive judgments. So, availability heurist is a heurist in which leads to improper judgment which basically means that we trust people trust their memory more and based on that they make the judgments. Similar to that the representative heurist gives the fact that since a particular information a particular line information which is available from memory since it represents or it, it, it is uh, very representative to a certain kind of category people make these kind of judgment errors and similar to that is the anchoring and effect or anchoring error. When in addition to that there are several other biases which can appear in judgment for example, the hindsight bias, the bias of illusory correlations or the bias conjugation fallacy and several other kind of errors which is there. In the last section, we discuss something called decision making. So, this is the last process which happens after reasoning and judgment. Once reasoning and judgment is there, a number of options are available to choose from and so decision making a process where we go ahead and look at the number of options which are available to us and make a final choice. Now, whenever we make this choice, this choice is always under certain kind of risk and certain kind of uncertainty and so 
as humans we always wish to make the best choices which are there and which is rational. So, uh, what is a rational choice? The rational choice is the one which gives you which maximizes your profit, but minimizes your loss and that is what we tend to do. So, this is what uh, decision making was all about. Now, we looked at two different ways of making decisions. First was the normative view where we looked at something called the expected utility theorem and the violations of it. Now, in the expected utility theorem, we looked at what is expected utility and we, we calculated that expected utility or the descriptive model of decision making suggests that uh, decision making has to be made in terms of what is the utility of a particular option and what is the probability of that option happening. And we looked at this kind of a calculation and the option which gives us the maximum utility and has the maximum probability of occurrence is the one we select. And we looked at that this is how a rational decision maker should make the decisions, but with humans enough information is not available or information is not available and so they tend to make irrational choices or irrational interpretations. So, what they tend to do is they tend to do violations of this expected utility by doing something called preference reversal or reversal shifts which basically means that if they choose an option 1 in a particular situation they keep on reversing or they keep on shifting the choices in a situation 2, situation 3 and so on 4. Whereas, the expected utility theory believes that if a option A is chosen under condition condition 1, the same option should be chosen under n number of different conditions which has to occur. And so, we looked at some descriptive theories of decision making. The theory that we looked at is called the prospect theory, which basically says that the gains and losses which comes out of a particular decision are mapped onto different dimensions. Larger gains have show smaller increase or smaller increase in feeling, whereas smaller losses show higher increase in pain. And so, losses and gains are interpreted differently by human beings. Also, the fact that not only these uh, gains and losses of how it is the way a particular gain and or a, a particular option is presented to you whether it is in a grain frame or a loss frame will decide what option are you going to choose from a number of options which are given to you. So, given the fact that a particular option is given to you in a gain frame people choose sure bets, but if something is given to you in a loss frame people are more risky. So, people are more risk aversive in a gain frame whereas, people are more risk prone in a loss frame. Beside that, we also looked at something called two phenomena of psychological accounting and sunk cost effect, which are basically demonstration or extensions of what prospect theory suggests. It suggests that people tend to throw good money after bad money, which basically means that people value those options which have taken a large part of their money and but still are unenjoyable, whereas they do not go for better options, options which have taken in lesser money are, but are more enjoyable. Similarly, when people have to spend on things which have been assigned a certain psychological account, people will not like to invest onto those options, whereas if some uh, a particular loss or particular gain has not been psychologically accounted for people would like to spend more money on to it. The last section we looked at how effect it interacts with decision making and what is the role of effect in decision making and we looked at there are two modes one is the effect mode and the other is the descriptive mode. In the descriptive mode people the more conservative mode people are tend to think in non effective way and tend to donate more whereas, in the effective mode people make decisions in terms of how they feel about it and so they are more conservative and they are influenced more by the sweep of or the scope of the particular effect. So, this in total is the number of things that has to be studied that any course on cognitive psychology has to happen. And as you can see, we started our journey from the history of cognitive psychology, moved out to perception, attention, then memory, several forms of memory, then language, thinking and problem solving, decision making, visual memories and so on and so forth. So, this course was an attempt for, from my side to basically introduce you to a very basic knowledge of cognitive psychology, although cognitive psychology this is just an introduction and this is just the starting point of cognitive psychology. Any course of cognitive psychology, each chapter of this section can be expanded further and can be studied further into more basic fields. And once you do a course in cognitive psychology, the other fields that opens up are cognitive neuroscience or fields of neuroscience, cognitive technology and so on, so on and so forth. So, the whole field of cognitive science then opens up with you because cognitive psychology is an inherent part of 
any cognitive program or brain and behavior program in any western university or any university which is out there. So, I hope that you enjoyed this whole 12 weeks ride with me, enjoyed each part of it, there were points at which you may not have understood, you are free to some concepts, you are free to write back to me and consult with it. I am probably sure that you enjoyed this whole ride for 12 weeks, I would like to then say a final goodbye to you and hope you do good in your exams, goodbye and thank you.